Um, greetings from Living a Bible Church. It's always good to be here and actually to see some people who used to be part of our congregation. So it's good to see them here and enjoy the fellowship, though we move around the country perhaps for various reasons. There we go. God's design for happiness from the book of Ecclesiastes. Those two don't typically go together, but uh, we'll look at Ecclesiastes to see God's design for your happiness. A favorite book of mine in the scriptures, and I think by the end of today, um, hopefully of yours too, if not already. God's design for your happiness. I want to open with a few questions about happiness, but they're not your stereotypical questions that go something like, would you really be happy if you win a million rands? Of course you'll be happy. Um, these, these questions come at it from an Ecclesiastes point of view. So as we begin, consider these questions and the answer Ecclesiastes gives. Would you be happy if all your hard work was ultimately for nothing? Well, that's how life works, apparently, because Ecclesiastes 2, verse 11 says, Then I considered all that my hands have done, all the toil I had expended in doing it. And behold, behold is the Hebrew word for look up and listen. Behold, all was vanity and striving after wind, and there was nothing to be gained under the sun. Under the sun is a little phrase to, to refer to earthly life, right? That's how life works. Life works in a way that you'll definitely not be happy. Would you be happy if all your wisdom made you know better than the common idiot? I don't think we would be happy at all, and yet that is how life seems to work. Ecclesiastes 2 verse 15, and I said in my heart, what happens to the fool will happen to me also. That's the wisest man who ever lived who said that. Why then have I been so very wise? And I said in my heart that this also is vanity. And if you have lived long enough on earth, you kind of resonate with that statement, don't you? Would you be happy if your life was no different to that of meaningless animals? You're like, well, we're Christians. We know we're made in the image of God. Big difference. Well, life seems to kind of work according to this question. Ecclesiastes 3, verse 19 and 20. For what happens to the children of man and what happens to beast is the same. As one dies, so dies the other. They all have the same breath, and man has no advantage over the beasts, for all is vanity. All go to one place, all are from the dust, and to dust all return. You sometimes feel that way, don't you? Everything just seems to die. You can, you can be a budgie or you can be a person. You just die eventually. Life is not very happy, is it? Would you be happy if the more you get, the more you need? And everybody is chuckling at the recent budget adjustments, right? Would you be happy if the more you got and received in life, the more you needed to get and receive in life? And yet life seems to work that way. Ecclesiastes 5, verse 11. When goods increase, they increase who eat them. I've got four children. Okay? According to the national average, that's above average. According to my extended family, that's way below the average. But it's true. When goods increase, you finally get a salary increase, then another one comes along that eats it all. What advantage has the owner of all the things that he gets but to see them with his eyes? The only advantage you have is when you receive your paycheck and the notification comes from a bank and you're like, I see it, and it's gone. <laughs> Would you be happy if the right thing ruins you, but evildoers seem to succeed? Well, now it just reads like the local newspaper, right? <laughs> Yet life works that way. Ecclesiastes 7 verse 15, in my vain life I have seen everything. There is a righteous man who perishes in his righteousness. He did the right thing and he died. And there's a wicked man who actually is very successful and prolongs his life through his evil doing. <clears throat> Ecclesiastes 8 verse 14, same thing. There's a vanity that takes place on earth. That there are righteous people to whom it happens according to the deeds of the wicked. And there are wicked people to whom it happens according to the deeds of the righteous. I said that this also is vanity. 
Would you be happy if the best of us are no better than fish and birds? Fish and birds. We're not talking about oxen that plow fields or horses that bring you places. We're talking about fish and birds, the pets you keep, just to look nice. Would you be happy if the best of us are no better than fish and birds? Ecclesiastes 9, verse 11 and 12. Again, I saw that under the sun the race is not to the swift, nor the battle to the strong, nor bread to the wise, nor riches to the intelligent, nor favor to those with knowledge, but time and chance happen to them all, for man does not know his time. Like fish that are taken in an evil net, and like birds that are caught in a snare, so the children of men are snared at an evil time when it suddenly falls upon them. <clears throat> Natural disasters strike. And people seem to go the same way as the pets in the house. It suddenly comes upon them. Would you be happy if politics dictated that fools become rulers? Very fitting question for election year. Would you be happy? Well, of course you wouldn't be happy. All these questions, of course you wouldn't be happy. And yet it seems that is how life works, isn't it? Ecclesiastes 10, verse 5, 6, and 7. There's an evil that I have seen under the sun, as it were an error proceeding from the ruler. Folly is set in many high places, but the rich sit in a low place. I've seen slaves on horses and princes walking on the ground like slaves. He says, I've observed that in politics. It's often the fools that become the rulers. If this is how life works, and doesn't it work that way? If this is how life works, you need to recognize that life will definitely not make you happy. That's not really the point of Ecclesiastes, but that's the point that's made thus far, hasn't it? How can we then say that God has a design for happiness Human happiness under the sun. How can we say God has a design for happiness if the book on that design for happiness says you're not going to find it? And every time you think you find it, you're just going to have the joy of seeing it and then it's going to disappear. How can we say that God has a design for your happiness? Now we know God has a design for your happiness because one of the most common introductory words in a sentence in the Bible are, blessed are. Remember how Jesus started his preaching? Blessed are, blessed are, blessed are. There's blessing to be had under the sun. Yet you don't feel blessed all the time, do you? If we took a poll just now, in what attitude did you arrive at church camp? <laughs> Some of you, like everyone in our car, would say depressed, because we had a screaming fit for the last five minutes in the car. <laughs> Or you look at those who claim to have a blessed status and they call themselves so blessed and Facebook, they post these things of how they're so blessed and actually all it seems is that they're rich. Not exactly an objective standard of blessing now, is it? The problem with our view of blessing is that it is defined in terms of outcome, not defined in terms of design. It's a very, very significant difference. What do I mean with that? Well, let me set the stage with a very, very important distinction. These are very important concepts for this whole weekend. Outcome versus design. I'm happy when it turns out a certain way compared to I am happy because I just went about it the right way, irrespective of the outcome. Or, I've got a rights-based living. We've got human rights, our constitution says so, right? So it must be true. And if I get my rights fulfilled, then I'll be happy compared to living according to your duties. I have duties. My constitution doesn't say so, but my Bible does. And if I fulfill my duties, even if my rights are never fulfilled, I can be happy. You understand these two very different ways of thinking. Or I've got expectations, Mostly unmet expectations. And because they are expectations and because they're unmet, I am mostly unhappy. Compared to I have responsibilities in life and as long as I fulfill them, I will be happy. Very, very important distinctions. And I'm going to reference these terms repeatedly. So now on the one side, you've got outcome-based living, you've got rights-based living, you've got expectations-based living. And on the other side, you've got design-based living. 
where you have duties to fulfill and responsibilities to meet. Okay, very important distinction. You're going to see it flesh out in the book of Ecclesiastes in the most beautiful way. Outcomes, what do you want in life? And if you get it, you'll be happy. Versus design, what was life made for? And if I can fulfill that, I'll be happy. Right, what do you think you're entitled to get? And if you get it, you'll be happy. Compared to duties, what are you obliged to do? And if you do it, you'll feel fulfilled. Expectations. What do you expect to get from life and everybody around you? And if you get them, you'll be happy compared to responsibilities. I've got things that I'm responsible for and I'll take care of those things very well. And that will give me happiness. With that then, let's start going through Ecclesiastes and see what the design for your happiness is, what the duties that bring happiness are, what the responsibilities that you have under the sun are that will make you really happy if you fulfill them. Turn to Ecclesiastes if you're not there already. Ecclesiastes is all about life under the sun. It's a little phrase that it uses to say, I'm observing earthly life from an earthly perspective, and these are my conclusions. And we read a number of them, right? Very depressing conclusions. But Ecclesiastes is not primarily about the vanity of life under the sun. The vanity of life from an earthly perspective here on earth. Ecclesiastes is actually about God's design for you living life under the sun. It's not vanity of vanities, all is vanities, life under the sun from life under the sun perspective, but rather there's a design for your happiness and a few other things. There's a design for your happiness with life under the sun when you recognize the purpose God designed it for. Ecclesiastes is about life under the sun, but the best kept secret of Ecclesiastes is actually for God's design for life under the sun. And so it's a profoundly optimistic book in all its pessimism. You literally have books debating whether it's optimistic or pessimistic. Like, have you read it? Okay, it's obviously both. (laughs) But the one seems to trump the other, doesn't it? All your expected outcomes of life, with all the rights that you think you're entitled to, are mentioned in Ecclesiastes under the heading of vanity, life under the sun. But overwhelming them all in Ecclesiastes are the affirmations of God's design with the duties and responsibilities he has given you for life under the sun. God has a design for your happiness. Thankfully, right? The key to unhappiness is to have an outcome-based of thinking, The key to happiness is to have a design-based approach to life. So, some quick verses in Ecclesiastes to first show you God has a design, and then we're going to look at four four insights into that design. First of all, God has a design. Let's just quickly affirm that. Okay, we're in Ecclesiastes. It seems very depressing. God has a design. That's wonderful news. Ecclesiastes 3, verse 10. I have seen the business that God has given to the children of man to be busy with. We're not talking about happiness yet. We're just talking about the fact that life is not a kind of unfortunate flow of events under the sun. Life is a certain business that God has specifically given us so that we'll be busy with it. God has a design for life. Ecclesiastes 7, verse 13. Consider the work of God. Who can make straight what he has made crooked? Speaking to a doctor the other day, and she says, I've got two tasks in life. Relief suffering and make sure you don't die. Both of those are guaranteed. You are going to suffer and you're going to die. (laughs) Who can make straight what God seems to have made very crooked? God has a plan for even the crooked things in life. Ecclesiastes 7, verse 29. See, this alone I have found. You love it in in Ecclesiastes. He does it a few times where he says, here's one thing that kind of sums it all up. Here's the one thing I found. 
God has made man upright, straight, but they have sought out many schemes. God has a design for mankind. We are the ones messing it up. It's probably because we have that outcome-based approach to life rather than the design approach to life. God made everything fine. It's like a car that was built to be driven a certain way. The design of the car is still intact. The best way to drive that car is according to the design of that car. And yet, when you look at a perfectly designed car, you sometimes see it driven in a horrendous way. We came all the way from Harrisburg this morning. Okay? Not all the cars drove as well as they're designed to drive. What's the problem? The design of the car? Well, you might say so. Okay, you might blame the brand that starts with a B and ends with a W. Um, you might blame the brand, but it's not the brand's fault now, is it? It's the sin of the driver that's the problem. The best way to drive the car is according to the design. If the car is not driving according to its design, it's not the designer's problem. It's the fault of the driver now, isn't it? Irrelevant of the design that might be perfect, the sin lies with the driver. So also, God has given us a design for life. He has made man to be happy in a certain way. We are the ones taking that design and say, I'm not going to honor the design because I want something else. And so we are the ones who mess it up. And then the newspaper articles and journalists come and say, life's a mess. In the meantime, you realize life is fine. It's the people that make it a mess. Your marriage was designed just fine. Marriage is not the problem. It's the ungodliness of one or both of the people in the marriage that's the problem, right? Same with parenting, same with your work, whatever you do. God has a design that is just fine. Even sin affected, it is still just fine. He's made it crooked intentionally, yet man is the one messing it all up. And so happiness, back to happiness, comes from fulfilling God's design. There is one, if we know what it is and we pursue it, we'll be happy. It's that simple. And so, today, for our session now at least, four insights into God's design to your happiness. We're going to go through Ecclesiastes all over the place fairly quickly. I'll put the verses up so you can see them. Four insights into God's design for your happiness. Now, you have to put your thinking caps on because the first one is already going to throw you for a bit of a curve. The first insight into God's design for your happiness is that earthly futility is part of God's design for your happiness. It's a profound insight from Ecclesiastes. Earthly futility, vanities of vanities, all under the sun is vanity, is part of God's design for your happiness. It's the crooked part of God's design that you cannot make straight, but once you realize that it is crooked by design, the happier you'll be. Ecclesiastes 1 verse 13, and I applied my heart, Solomon saying, I applied my heart to seek and to search out by wisdom all that is done under heaven. What's the conclusion? It is an unhappy business that God has given the children of man to be busy with. God has has work for you to do that you have to keep yourself busy with and it is an unhappy work. And you need to realize that right up front. This is in chapter 1. You need to realize that it's an unhappy work that you have been given to be busy with. Subtle conclusion, that work is not going to make you happy. (laughs) Something else is going to have to make you happy. It's an unhappy business that God has given to children of man to be busy with. God has intentionally made this life with a significant component of intentional unhappiness. Ecclesiastes 8, verse 16 and 17. When I applied my heart to know wisdom and to see the business that is done on earth, I neither day nor night do one's eyes see sleep. So just continuing going on day after day after day and it just drags on. Then I saw all the work of God that man cannot find out the work that is done under the sun. He says, I look at all of life, I'm looking for purpose and my one conclusion is I can't figure it out. However, 
much. Man may toil on seeking, he will not find it out. Even though a wise man claims to know, he cannot find it out. Oh, that gives us as Christians, even baby Christians, so much confidence when you debate atheists and people like that, right? You kind of walk into a room and you, you know you're going to have a discussion or on Facebook or whatever, and already you come with a presupposition of you have no clue, do you? I'm not very smart, but at least I know the source of insight into the business of life. You can try as much as you like. You can even write books claiming to be an expert on it, but if you don't consider life from God's point of view, the earthly futility of life should be your only conclusion. I can't figure out the purpose of life all by myself. Earthly futility is part of God's design for your happiness. And the sooner you come to that realization, the happier you will be. Search as you please for the purpose of life and the source of happiness. There is no pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. It isn't there. You'll never find it. God designed life to be an unsolvable puzzle. I like these little, these little mind teaser games you get, right? Puzzles you have to shift blocks around or, or wires you need to untangle from each other. This one doesn't have a solution. At least not without the puzzle maker's help. Right? You've done those puzzles. You're like, it's impossible. Okay, I, I just can't get this ball through that hole or this string off this loop. And then you Google it. You're like, oh, that was easy. <laughs> right? <laughs> If you search for purpose and happiness in life, you'll just never find it. And then you open a Bible and Ecclesiastes of all the books, and you're like, oh, oh, that makes sense. God designed it to be unsolvable without turning to Ecclesiastes. But you turn to Ecclesiastes, and there are three more insights into life, thankfully. Earthly futility is the first insight into life. The second one is earthly enjoyment is part of God's design for your happiness But you must be grateful to God for it. Very important addition. First of all, we're talking about earthly enjoyment. Frivolous earthly pleasures. Okay? Good food. Comfortable seats. Whatever it is. That's part of God's design for happiness. And yet, those who have it rarely seem happy because they are not grateful to God for it. Ecclesiastes, chapter 2, verse 24 and 25. <clears throat> there is therefore nothing better for a man than that he should eat and drink and find enjoyment in his toil. You like that verse, don't you? <laughs> this also I saw is from the hand of God. For apart from him, who can eat and who can have enjoyment? It sounds like one of the most carnal, earthly, worldly verses. And then it gets followed up with another verse that says, this is God's gift to you. Enjoy it. Ecclesiastes 3, verse 12 and 13. I perceive that there's nothing better for them than to be joyful, to to do good as long as they live. Also, that everyone should eat and drink and take pleasure in all his toil. This is God's gift to man. It's God's gift to you. I had a friend who was a a director of a, a significant firm and a junior director still, <clears throat> and he realized, I'm not depressed. He says, I, I'm not depressed, but I'm not exactly happy either. Okay, all this promotion, all this work, everything, I'm not overly stressed about it. It's just kind of bland. Now, he comes to a pastor for help. It wasn't me. It was another pastor. He just told me about it later. He goes to a pastor for help. He says, I don't think I'm depressed, but I'm not exactly excited about life either, and my family's fine, work's fine, everything's fine. <clears throat> And the advice from the pastor to this new director was to enjoy dinner. (laughs) He says, go enjoy dinner. You're grateful to God. You're worshiping God, but everything is bland. Do you enjoy dinner? Well, it's fine. It's fine. The pastor's advice is, you're filthy rich. Go buy the nicest steak you can ever afford. Cook it in the most beautiful, grateful, joyful way in your wonderful kitchen that you have for himself. He's a good cook. And then enjoy it. Sit down and say, I'm going to enjoy this steak with my wife and my kids around the table. The phone is thrown into the pool. It's going to be a wonderful dinner. That's Ecclesiastes' advice. 
God has given you things to enjoy. Earthly enjoyment is also part of God's design for happiness. And we're just not enjoying those gifts from God. You're not entitled to good steak, so if you're the poorest guy and you cannot afford the steak, you cannot now be unhappy because your rights weren't fulfilled and your expectations weren't met. But if you can enjoy something in life, go enjoy it. Might not always fit your budget, but it's a good principle of life. Sometimes go get something nice. Stop by McDonald's and get the ice cream. (laughs) It's God's gift to man. Ecclesiastes 5, verse 18 and 19, Behold, what I've seen to be good and fitting is to eat and drink and find enjoyment in all the toil with which one toils under the sun the few days of his life that God has given him, for this is his lot. We're going to look at God's design for your busyness in the next session. But you are ready. Find enjoyment in your toil simply because that's what you're busy doing right now from 8 to 5. If the outcome is depressing, that's okay. It's the toil that you can still find some enjoyment with. It's nice to fix something. It's nice to see something come from your work. It's nice to have a cup of coffee while you're doing vanity work. Everyone also to whom God has given wealth and possessions and power to enjoy them and to accept his lot and rejoice in his toil, this is the gift of God. Be careful of the pursuit of wealth without the pursuit of earthly enjoyment of that wealth and gratefulness to God for giving you that enjoyment. Ecclesiastes 8 verse 15, and I commend joy. We're like, yes, seriously, okay? We commend joy. I I recommend happiness. I recommend it. For man is nothing better under the sun but to eat and drink and be joyful. For this will go with him in his toil through the days of his life that God has given him under the sun. Now, you've seen people like that. They wake up happy every morning. And they have the same depressing job that you do. And yet they're happy through it all. Guess what? The work didn't make them happy. The happiness made them work. So I commend being happy when you go to work. I commend being happy when you wake up. I commend being happy when you go to church. And there's other sinners there. I commend it. And then go eat and drink and find enjoyment in the things of life. That's part of God's design for your happiness. You know it's futile. That was the first insight. But you also know that the nice things are nice by God's design. My favorite one in Ecclesiastes, my wife knows this very well. Ecclesiastes 9, verse 7, 8, and 9. You need to highlight those in your Bible, circle them, whatever you do to your Bible. If you don't mark in your Bible, mark this one now and go buy a new clean Bible. Ecclesiastes 9, verse 7. Go, eat your bread with joy. Drink your wine with a merry heart. For God has already approved what you do. That's a great statement. In the book on how depressing everything is, there's a statement saying, God approves. Your boss doesn't. Your clients don't. You don't approve your own work. But God has already approved what you do. So let your garments be always white. Let not oil be lacking on your head. Go for a haircut would be our equivalent, roughly speaking. Enjoy life with a wife whom you love all the days of your vain life that he has given you under the sun. It's not that he's just talking about all the wonderful things and just be happy and ignore the bad. He says, in all the bad, let's admit the bad, you can still find enjoyment in the earthly pleasures. Why should you go eat your bread with joy even though life is so vain? Because that is your portion in life and in your toil at which you toil under the sun. That is your portion should make you think of Moses dividing up the promised land. Every tribe gets its portion, and every clan and every family gets their portion. And that is their portion. It's their inheritance. It's the piece they get of the promised land. That's your bet. And God says, for all mankind, the bit of life that God gives you, that can be yours, is earthly enjoyments. Food, drink, Marriage, nice clothes, nice grooming. (laughs) All earthly things, aren't they? God has given them as your portion to enjoy, so go enjoy it. God's design for your happiness includes an admittance that earthly futility is part of the design. 
Okay, the fact that things are, are depressing is part of the design to make you happy. The second insight then into God's design for your happiness is that earthly enjoyment is not frivolous and unspiritual. It is legitimately to be enjoyed, but you must be grateful to God for it. So you don't end up like all the depressed people who are so happy on Facebook because they're really rich. Third, third insight into God's design for your happiness is that human limitations are part of God's design for your happiness. Human limitations are part of God's design for your happiness. But you must be wise enough to realize what those limitations are. Human limitation is a frustrating thing, isn't it? And yet, it's by design like that. Human limitations, your limitations, are part of God's design for your happiness. You need to realize you can't do everything. Okay, the sports brands are wrong. MacArthur was once preaching on this concept And he said, you can't even lick your elbow. So you need to realize you've got limitations. And all of you are now like, (laughs) okay, we have limitations. And God has designed our limitations to help us find happiness in this world. And we have to realize what our limitations are in order to find the happiness. Ecclesiastes 3, verse 10 and 11. I have seen the business that God has given to the children of man to be busy with. He has made everything beautiful in its time. You're like, okay, well, that's wonderful. Where did this come from in Ecclesiastes? Well, there's another verse. Also, he has put eternity into man's heart. Okay, so he's he's put the concept that we live forever into man's heart. We know a future. That's a concept we grasp. And we can even grasp the fact that, to some degree, that it goes on forever. He has put eternity into man's heart, yet, this is how he did it. So that he cannot find out what God has done from the beginning to the end. Okay, weird concept, right? God has made you an eternal being and made you aware of the fact that you are an eternal being. There is a future, there is a next minute, there is a tomorrow, there is eternity. We understand that. Okay, we're aiming somewhere, we're going places. Yet, God put that in our heart with a little kind of limitation built in. You can't figure out what's going to happen in the future. In fact, you can't even make sense of the past. We have a concept of time. We've got a concept of progression of time. We know we're aiming for something. There's purpose. It's not just now. And yet I have no idea what the purpose is. I cannot understand exactly how all things are working together, obviously without God's word. God has made us limited, even though we have an understanding of being limitless. You know there's eternity. You do not know what's going to happen tomorrow. Isn't that a weird concept? You know that it can go on forever, but you don't know what the very next thing would be. I just don't know what the next step is, but I know there are lots of steps. Ecclesiastes 3, verse 18. I said in my heart with regard to the children of man that God is testing them that they may see that they themselves are but beasts. It's a great insight into how life works. Okay? God is testing them, especially unbelievers, right, who don't understand this. God is testing them. Like every day is a test, and every day they fail. And they never realize they're failing at understanding what life is all about. They conclude that we're just beasts. Okay? All your famous fathers of psychology are, oh, we're brute beasts. We're just following our natural instincts and pleasures and desires. Well, that's their conclusion. They failed the test to understand that human limitations is actually part of your happiness, not the frustration of life. Ecclesiastes 7, verse 14. In the day of prosperity, be joyful. In the day of adversity, consider. God has made the one as well as the other so that man may not find out anything that will be after him. Right, you, you see that on the, the news, right? Uh, this, this man just bought a brand new car. It was in the news about a year ago. I still remember the story vividly. Just bought a new car, um, got the loan, bought a brand new car, didn't get insurance on it and wrecked it on the first day, and now he has no car and all payments for another five years or whatever it is. 
He had, he had wealth enough to get this car. And then the very next day, he lost it all. And now he's worse off than he was. You just don't know what's going to come after you. You might be rich one day and poor the next. You just don't know. So when you are having a good day, then be happy. That's God's portion for you. And when you have a very difficult day, then lighten up a bit and learn some lessons. What is the lesson you need to learn? God makes the good and the bad. And the reason he does both and sometimes mixes it up randomly for you, appears random to us, is so that you will realize you don't know what tomorrow holds. You are limited. And so, each moment has the right response, and then realize that moment can suddenly swap around, and then you again need the right response, and at least you can realize you don't know what the next moment will hold. Ecclesiastes 11, verse 5. As you do not know the way the Spirit comes to the bones in a womb of a woman with child, so you do not know the work of God who makes everything. Uh, we've got videos, 3D animations, things like that, of how conception takes place. Absolutely amazing. That's not what this verse is talking about. This verse is talking about how does the spirit enter those bones? <laughs> how does it become a living human being, not just the physical, biological things? You don't know that, do you? And that's just one part of life. <laughs> God has made everything. And he understands how everything works. You don't even understand one part. I granted it's a difficult part. But you are limited, aren't you? And Ecclesiastes is trying to convince you to admit that you have limitations. And that is still part of the design for your happiness. The third insight into God's design for your happiness is that you are a limited being with great, vast limitations. And if you're wise enough to realize what they are, you're on your way to God's design for your happiness. And in fourth, and this one you might have predicted if you know Ecclesiastes at all, the fear of the Lord. This is the one we're going to end on because Ecclesiastes ends on it. The fear of the Lord is part of God's design for your happiness. Great evangelistic concept, okay? The fear of the Lord is part of God's design for happiness on life under the sun. But you will only realize that it is part of God's design for your marriage when you fulfill, when you sense and fulfill your obligation to God. Obviously, this is the big part that the world gets wrong. They get the other three wrong too. But this one they ignore altogether. God's design for your happiness is that you realize you have obligations to God, and when you sense the fear of God, you will be a lot happier. It's that simple. To put it in other terms, maybe more New Testament-like terms, godly people are happier. Godly people are happier. Not more selfish people are happier. Not those who insist on their own ways are happier. Godly people are happier people. Ecclesiastes 5, verse 1 and 3 and 4 to 7 is a very parallel thought there. Same thing said twice in different words. Guard your steps when you go to the house of God. Okay? Be careful when you go to worship. God is not your buddy, in other words. Guard your steps when you go to the house of God. What does he mean with that? Be not rash with your mouth, lest your heart be hasty to utter a word before God. For God is in heaven and you are on earth. Therefore, let your words be few. Why should God be angry at your voice and destroy the work of your hands? God is the one you must fear. Well, this is a terrifying verse for lots of what's going on in Christianity today, right? Right? We do not come to worship with statements of, I declare God is going to bless me. There's a reason we have a saying like, don't stand next to him, lightning from heaven might strike him. Okay, now you don't have to be afraid of that. God never has collateral damage. He's always very precise in his judgment. But the, the concept is still valid, right? Don't be rash when you come to worship God. You need to learn to fear God. And if anything has to convince you that you need to have a right view of God, just realize He's in heaven, you're on earth. 
It's like a CEO going down to the lowest worker in his company and saying, just remember, I've got the corner office on the 74th floor. <laughs> okay, you come in the back entrance. There's, there's a difference there, and you have to realize that. You need to fear God. Otherwise, God will destroy you for your own words. That's not happiness. Ecclesiastes 7, verse 18. It is good that you should take hold of this, and from that not withhold your hand. For the one who fears God shall come out from both of them. And what on earth does that verse mean? It basically says, do a bit of this, do a bit of that, because the one who fears God shall come out from both of them. Don't get overly consumed with one thing or overly consumed with another thing. Have some moderation in your life, and you will realize that because you fear God, good comes from everything you do. Oh, no, I need to pursue my work. I need to pursue my work. And everybody has to understand I'm focusing on my work because that's going to make me successful. Proverbs, or Ecclesiastes says, no, no, no. Do some of that, but also fulfill your other responsibilities. Do everything well. Because God is going to make you prosper from everything that you do. Not some very narrow-minded pursuits. You have lots of responsibilities to fulfill. Fulfill them all. Because happiness comes from all of them. Not just the one thing you've set your mind on. The one who fears God shall come out from both of them. Isn't that so true? You look at, especially with the COVID things that happened, and companies went under, and people lost jobs, and things like that. I have noticed from all the stories, horror stories, and stories of, I thought I was going to lose everything, and in the meantime I got promoted, is that those who fear the Lord were the last ones to be fired. Those who feared the Lord are the ones who had the best work ethic and survived even though they lost their job. They found other ways of income. Why? They didn't have their hearts set on just this one earthly thing from which my happiness shall come. They just did whatever the next responsibility was to fulfill. And they did just fine. The one who fears God shall benefit from both of them. Ecclesiastes 8, verse 5 to 7. Whoever keeps a command will know no evil thing, and the wise in heart will know the proper time and the just way. <clears throat> Isn't that a, literally something everybody wants? I would love the ability at every moment to know exactly what to do and say. Anybody with me? <laughs> I always would like to know what to do and what to say in every given moment. Cool. Yeah. Keep a command. Then you will know the proper time and the just way. For there is a time and there is a way for everything. There's always the right response. Although man's troubles lie heavy on him, we're not denying the troubles. We're just saying in every trouble, there's a wonderful right thing to do in the right way. For he does not know what is to be, that's us, for who can tell him our life will be? Okay, nobody can tell me what's happening next. I'm in a difficult time right now. There's trouble lying heavy on me, and there is a right, wonderful response in every moment. And who knows what that right response is? It's the one who keeps the commandments. Not the one who has a clear purpose of life, who has a clear vision for his future, who has clear goals and expectations, as our life coaches say. It is the one who knows the design and the commandments that come with that design. It's the one who obeys the Lord. Human limitations are overcome by fulfilling divine commands. Earthly futility, that first insight, is overcome by recognizing in the futility there are commands on how to deal with the futility. And if you keep the commands, the futility won't be so obvious anymore. You're going to overcome it with happiness. You see, we don't need an outcome-based living where we're pursuing certain goals. We need a design-based living with duties and responsibilities that are custom-made for that situation. And if you know what that is and you do it, it'll work. Okay, those of us who only read the user manual after everything else fails, okay, that's that, that, that lesson. I know how to unpack this thing and assemble it, and you get about halfway through, and you're like, oh, no, this doesn't work. Go back to instructions. Oh, the right way and the proper way has been told me in order of commandments. Literally, one, two, three, four, five. Okay, the, the Japanese to English is a bit messed up, but you can make sense of it. If you follow the instructions, it works. 
Ecclesiastes 11 verse 9. Rejoice, O young man, in your youth, and let your heart cheer you in the days of your youth. Young men, young women, go for it. Walk in the ways of your heart and the sight of your eyes. You see something, go for it. Go do it. But know that for all these things, God will bring you into judgment. God is going to evaluate what you do, for better or for worse. So go for it with the fear of God. With the absolute terror that if it's sinful, God is going to absolutely judge it. And with absolute confidence that if it's a righteous thing, God's going to reward it. Man up. Do something with the fear of God being your guardrails. You'll be happy. Ecclesiastes 12, verse 1. Remember also your Creator in the days of your youth, before the evil days come, and the years draw near of which you say, I have no pleasure in them. Before you get to a point in life, like us older guys that realize life sucks, before you get to that realization, learn to fear God. And guess what? You're going to realize life sucks much quicker, but you're also going to realize in the limitations and futility of life, there's great happiness if I just keep doing what God says. The climactic end of Ecclesiastes is well known to us. The end of the matter. All has been heard. He experimented. He did everything. The richest, wisest man who ever lived. Did every pursuit of life imaginable. And he says, here's my conclusion. Fear God and keep his commandments. For that is the whole entire duty of man. Because God will bring every deed into judgment with every secret thing, whether it's good, that gets rewarded, or evil and gets condemned. Fear God and keep his commandments. That is God's design for your happiness. Know that earth is futile. Life under the sun is is a futile pursuit. Know that you have things to enjoy that are very earthly. They're, They're nothing significant. They're super earthly. But they're there for your enjoyment, and you need to enjoy them. And know that your limitations are severe. And know that all of that helps you recognize that true happiness is designed for me. And it comes with really whatever I do, as long as I'm fearing God while I'm doing it. Just do the next right thing because you know God. Isn't that simple? It's it's maybe not always easy to do, but it's easier than not doing. (laughs) What's the right thing to do in this situation? I have no idea. This is the most messed up situation I've ever faced. Fear God and keep his commandments. Okay, what did God say about it? And if you don't know your Bible well enough, the guy next to you maybe does. (laughs) Your pastor certainly should, your elders. Ask them, what's the right thing to do in this situation? What are the commandments from God that help me solve this? That's not how we live, unfortunately, right? We instead go, how can I fix this? This is unpleasant. What can I do so that I'm not the poor one at the end that kind of got the short straw? Instead, come and say, what's the problem I'm facing? We're very open about that. Ecclesiastes doesn't deny that. What does God say about it? And what does God say to do about it? We have, unfortunately, by default, sinful nature, an outcome-based approach to life. We have an outcome-based approach to life. We think life is, is successful when it turns out a certain way, not when it was performed a certain way. That's outcome versus design, isn't it? An outcome based approach to life, a fulfillment of all perceived rights approach to life, a meeting of all your expectations approach to life will not give you happiness. It never has. If it's happiness, it's just online happiness. But, and we know this as Christians, right? We've experienced this already. Fulfilling your duties and responsibilities to God's design for life will bring great joy and great enjoyment to even the most cursed of things on life under the sun. God purposefully designed this world exactly the way it is so that we would stop seeking happiness in this life and instead fear him and keep his commandments and realize that makes life quite enjoyable. 
Ecclesiastes and this session is a, is a worldview kind of lesson, isn't it? It just like, it takes you out of this world. It kind of puts you next to the sun, so you can also look at life under the sun. And, and it just makes a whole lot more sense this way, doesn't it? Because it's a worldview kind of topic and session, I must, by necessity, affirm perhaps, the mo- well, definitely the most important reality that ever played out under the sun. Of all the past and future events that would ever work, kind of play out on life under the sun on planet Earth, you have the death and resurrection and ascension of Jesus Christ. It ticks all four of these insights. It ticks all four of them. Earthly futility. The most righteous man who ever lived died as a criminal. And then it suddenly changed. He wasn't actually buried as a criminal. He was buried as a rich man. I don't think you can figure out what life would be next. (laughs) Earthly enjoyments. He went into a secluded place to rest from time to time. He didn't just keep on chasing his ministry. He didn't even spend time with all 12 apostles all the time. Someone just took some of them because they were the more fun ones to be with. (laughs) He ate and drank. When the good wine ran out, he made better wine. (laughs) His limitations were the most limiting of all limitations. We are finite earthly creatures with limitations. He's the divine God that lived as a human. (laughs) Talk about limitations. Philippians 2, right? And yet he was the one who obeyed the Father's will, even in the greatest of trials. He says, take this cup away from me, but not my will, but yours be done. What was the earthly outcome of his life? A criminal death and conspiracies about his resurrection. And so you have to look at that, the biggest event that ever took place at on this earth, life under the sun, and you need to realize what was its purpose. Now, we don't have to go all theological on the purpose. We can simply go historical. Let me read you the account of the purpose of his life from Acts chapter 17 as we close. Just listen as I read Acts 17, verse 24 and following. It's a great sermon, by the way. Worldview sermon. The God who made the world and everything in it Being Lord of heaven and earth does not live in temples made by man, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. And he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined allotted periods and the boundaries of their dwelling place. God designed life. He decides who lives where, how different our various nations are. And then he said, "Uh, you, you live in this time of history and you live on that piece of land for your time here on earth. And by the way, if you immigrate and go somewhere else, that was God's design too. You didn't leave this piece of land. He just said you're going to move to that piece of land. Why does God micromanage every little detail? Why is he the absolute source and designer of absolutely everything? Life and breath and everything. Verse 27. That they should seek God. And perhaps feel their way toward him and find him. Yet he's actually not far from each one of us. God designed it all so people will fear him, and it's not that difficult. It's not that difficult in life to realize I need to fear God. Have you realized how life sucks? God is making it incredibly easy for all mankind to seek God. And it's not even far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being. It's not that he started everything and went away. He's actively engaged in every part of our life. It's not exactly difficult to know that he's there. In him we live and move and have our being, as even some of your own poets have said. Even the world figures it out sometimes. We are indeed his offspring. Being then God's offspring, made by God and controlled by God in every way, we ought not to think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the art and imagination of man. The times of ignorance God overlooked. The fact that you are ignorant about God, God will overlook that. 
But now he commands all people everywhere to repent. Because he has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed. And of this he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. God has a design for your happiness. And he's literally designing all of life to make you realize, if I fear the Lord, everything has purpose. There's joy in everything if I learn to fear God. And you might be ignorant of the fact that that's the conclusion you need to make. And so God has even written it down for us in his word. And with it comes the transition of how you can realize that, and it's repents. Because God is going to judge. We're living on God's world with his design. The design is fine. We're messing it up. He makes it obvious to us that we're messing it up. So we can seek him because he's going to judge everything. So if you will be happy, then at the very least, make right with God. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, what a, what a kind of bird's eye view of life you give us. Thank you for the life of Jesus Christ that just proves everything your word says about our own lives. Lord, as we gather as Christians like this, Lord, will you give us great joy in knowing you? Will the the earthly pleasures of just being around each other and and having fun on a weekend um, make us realize that you are the giver of all good things? And all the trials that might have come with us in our hearts as we showed up this morning about the the futility, depressing state of affairs in this life. Lord, would you stir our hearts with your commandments on how to live. And may we fulfill your design with great joy for all eternity.